This video is brought to you by Keeps. What's up guys, Michael here with our latest book versus film. Today we're talking Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, which in the director's classic non-linear fashion made it to a theater near you long before the book reached your nightstand. Drawing from a long history of movie novelizations published as promotional tie-ins, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood gave us a chance to revisit our favorite 60s bromance. But is this book just a simple transcription of the Oscar-nominated screenplay, or did Tarantino have more ambitious plans? Let's find out in this book versus film on Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. And of course, spoilers ahead for both the book and the film. But before we get into it, I want to give a shout out to this week's sponsor, Keeps. Keeps is a subscription service that makes it easier and more affordable for guys to treat hair loss. For lots of guys, feeling good about your hair can be just as important as feeling good about the way you dress. So it makes sense to be stressed about losing your hair. The good news is that prevention is key, and with the right plan, you can keep those luscious locks. You can get started by having a free consultation with a Keeps doctor who can help you get both FDA approved prescriptions and over-the-counter medications shipped directly to your home. Your hair loss prevention medication will then automatically arrive every three months, so you won't have to worry about waiting in long pharmacy lines. And you'll have access to your Keeps doctor to ask any questions, and keep them up to date on your progress. So find out why Keeps has more five-star reviews than any of its competitors, and why hundreds of thousands of men trust Keeps for their hair loss prevention. If you're ready to take action and prevent hair loss, go to keeps.com slash wisecrack, or click the link in the description to receive 50% off your first order. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash wisecrack. Now, back to the show. As always, let's start by taking a glance at the similarities. Both versions of Once Upon a Time in Hollywood are mostly quiet, ruminative nostalgia pieces with some major meta vibes. The TV shows and movies within the movie conceit translates pretty well to the novel. Tarantino basically treats the Lancer TV show sequences as a book within the book. He tells the story of the Lancer clan as it might have been told in the Western dime novels of yesteryear. Beyond that, the book basically has the same story, characters, and feel as the movie. There are some occasional shifts in perspective, and the book glosses over some of the movie's key plot details, but the characters' journeys are relatively unchanged from what we saw on screen. Tarantino even references some of the same songs from the movie's soundtrack. But if the two texts were carbon copies, this video would be super boring. So let's dive into the differences. Difference number one, Cliff's a real jerk in the book. In the movie, Brad Pitt's stuntman character, Cliff Booth, seems equal parts Zen and Zora. He is a war hero with a Stillwater's demeanor who we know can handle himself in a fight before we ever see him in action. He has a devil-may-care attitude and is more than happy to spend his days taking punches for his best bud, Rick Dalton. Is that uh, how you describe your job, Cliff? What, carrying his load? Yeah, it's about right. But despite his cool head, he's hounded by rumors that he murdered his wife and seems humbled by his near brush with the prison system. Prison tried to get me all my life, but ain't got me yet. Say it does, it won't be because of you. Guilty or not, Cliff seems to see the death of his wife as a turning point, a second and perhaps undeserved chance at life. He seems like someone who doesn't take his freedom for granted and has a sincere appreciation for life's little blessings, or even just the day-to-day -day errands of a Hollywood gopher. While Book Cliff is mostly recognizable, he doesn't seem chastened to the same degree as his on-screen counterpart. It's revealed pretty early on that Cliff did intentionally kill his wife Billy, though his internal monologue spouts a laundry list of qualifying factors and semi-excuses. What's more, this isn't the only straight-up murder he's gotten away with. One scene lays out how Cliff, despite offering a very flimsy explanation to the cops, got away with killing a couple of seedy Italian mafiosos giving him the shakedown. The book reads, If a World War II hero wanted to shoot him dead in a pizza parlor, the police would pay for the pizza. Cliff even takes some time to taunt the unarmed men with war stories about how many Italians he killed to earn his Medal of Valor before putting a bullet into each of their heads. For the day I got that, pointing at the Medal of Valor, I killed at least seven. Maybe as many as nine, but at least seven. Cliff continued, and that was just one day. When I was in Sicily, I killed Italians every day. 
While he's far less cavalier about murdering his wife, the book repeatedly emphasizes the ease and maybe even pleasure with which Cliff is capable of committing murder. This all kind of undercuts the depth that Brad Pitt brought to his first Oscar winning role. Overall, Cliff really doesn't seem especially complicated in the book. Frankly, he often just seems like a lunatic. In the movie, despite his violent past and killer instincts when backed into a corner, Cliff spends most of his time just being like the most solid hang in Hollywood. He's happiest when kicking it with Rick Dalton and helping hitchhiking hippie chicks named Pussycat while refusing their underage sexual advances. While turning down Pussycat may just be an act of self-preservation, it still lends an air of asceticism that all contributes to his monk-like mystique. In the book though, Cliff has no compunction about using his movie star looks and easy charm to get laid. In fact, Tarantino makes a pretty big point of how absurdly prolific Cliff's sex life actually is. In one particularly cringe-inducing passage, a French pimp explains the extremely not suitable for work intricacies of sex work to Cliff, who is considering a post-war career as a Mac. And upon returning to Europe decades later to double for Rick in Spaghetti Westerns, Tarantino assures the reader that Cliff got busy betting a bevy of Italian beauties. In this second draft of his revisionist history, Tarantino also addresses the controversy surrounding Cliff's now infamous victory over Bruce Lee in a fistfight. He qualifies both men's fighting abilities and attempts to build an argument for Cliff's endurance in the ring with Cato. Writing, while Cliff wasn't anywhere near as skilled as the opponents he fought in any of his martial arts tournaments, he was something they weren't. He was a killer. He could see Cliff wasn't fighting Bruce Lee. Cliff was fighting his instinct to kill Bruce Lee. While this passage might diffuse some folks' objections to that scene, though it only further angered the Lee family, it definitely does serve to reinforce the book's notion of Cliff as a killer first, which is quite literally the last thing the movie depicts him as. Not only does the book foreground Cliff's ruthlessness, it actively diminishes two of his most humanizing characteristics, his friendship with Rick and his love for his dog, Brandy. Tarantino cuts the quiet scenes of the men bonding over late night drinks and FBI guest spots, and more alarmingly, tells us that Cliff has made Brandy compete in dog fights all over California. Now, it goes without saying that a big part of Cliff's on-screen allure, aside from Brad Pitt's handsome mug, is the sense of mystery surrounding the character. He's also funny, loyal, charming, and a really good friend. But when his backstory gets filled out in the book, it feels like a betrayal of the Cliff that we loved on screen. Screen Cliff seems like a dangerous but mostly decent person whose relationships with Brandy and Rick serve as constant reminders that he isn't defined by his violent past. But Book Cliff often just seems like a horny, homicidal maniac. I don't know about you, but I like my Cliff Booth to be a dog lover not a dog fighter, and if my perfect friend just absolutely has to kill, all I ask is that he saves his wrath for the murderous racist hippie cult kicking in the door of my house in the hills. And that brings us to difference number two. The Manson family is even creepier in the book. In the film, the Manson family's real life history of crime isn't made apparent until the end. For the most part, Tarantino just trades on the audience's awareness of Charles Manson to wring tension out of what might otherwise seem like totally innocuous scenes. A dude giving some hippie chick a ride out to the desert isn't inherently nerve-wracking. The same could be said of their beloved leader showing up to a house in the hills looking to track down an old friend. If you're somehow not already familiar with Charles Manson, those scenes would probably play a whole lot differently on a first watch. In contrast, the book makes explicit pretty early on that this family is super duper sinister. In chapter five, titled Pussycat's Creepy Crawl, Tarantino details one of the Manson mandated home invasions that were designed to test the nerves and commitment of his acolytes. Pussycat creeps through an open back door, strips naked, and well, crawls around the house, compelled at every moment by thoughts of Charles Manson. This establishes the Manson family as a threat and demonstrates their leader's Spengali-like hold on them. Before describing creepy crawling at her grand jury testimony, Susan Atkins, one of the Manson family murderers seen here eating her fill of dog food, described the manner in which she felt 
programmed by Charlie. She said, the words that would come from his mouth would not come from inside him. They would come from what I call the infinite. Tarantino illustrates that programming by having Manson hijack Pussycat's inner monologue to guide her through the process of sneaking upstairs and jumping into bed between the sleeping homeowners. Despite the rude awakening, these folks are otherwise unharmed. In reality, the creepy crawls were subtle but still threatening. Manson's followers would move household items around to plant seeds of paranoia in homeowners' minds. And if you ask Vincent Bugliosi, the prosecuting attorney in the trial of Charles Manson and author of Helter Skelter, these creepy crawling expeditions were dress rehearsals for murder. In this way, the book paints a clear picture of the threat these hippies posed in real life. On the other hand, some folks criticized the film, arguing that the Manson family is never depicted doing anything bad enough to justify the excessive violence they endure. But there is one very subtle factor that this criticism overlooks, which is f the Manson family. Even if your heart goes out to the hapless would-be killers in the movie, the book makes it clear that they weren't just in the wrong place at the wrong time. Up until the film's final sequence, they're mostly presented as a harmless nuisance, but the book shows the Manson family doing the devil's business long before they ever make it to Cielo Drive. Speaking of finales, let's get into difference number three. The book ends with a new beginning. Now, the film famously concludes in a total bloodbath, with Cliff and Brandy doing most of the heavy lifting. Even Italian starlet Francesca Capucci gets in a few licks before Rick goes all 14 fist of McCluskey on Susan Atkins. And the film's final shot shows Tate inviting Rick into her home, which bodes well for his career, but overall leaves a lot to the imagination. In contrast, the book addresses this climactic encounter with just a couple paragraphs pretty early on and pretty casual. On page 110, Tarantino writes that Rick and Cliff made short order of the housebreakers, killing all three in a brutal fight. He adds that Cliff bashed in the faces of the guy and one of the girls, and Rick set the assailant on fire with the practice flamethrower left over from McCluskey. And that's more or less all the book says about the gory details of the film's climax. While the book does describe the publicity bump and career revitalization Rick Dalton received from the home invasion gone wrong, it's not terribly concerned with what went down that night. In fact, the book ends somewhere near the film's midpoint, with Rick wrapping his first day on the Lancer set and hitting up a bar where he's greeted by adoring fans, one of whom is young Quentin Tarantino's stepfather. But that's not the only time Tarantino is mentioned in this bizarro Hollywood history. He also gets a shout out for directing an Oscar-nominated performance by the film's child actress character, Trudy Frazier. Tarantino's fondness for Frazier is clear in the film, but even more apparent in the book. Several of Trudy's scenes that were shot but ultimately cut from the movie make their way back into the story here, including a phone call between her and Rick that ends the novelization. Trudy and Rick run their lines together over the phone, dialing into their characters and making each other laugh and cheer as they perform the Lancer finale. Rick seems grateful for the wild Bronco ride that's been his life, and the book makes sure to let us know that he and Trudy knocked them dead on set the next day. The phone call they share recalls a moment earlier in the book, when Trudy teaches Rick about method acting. She tells him, the script is the script, and we're doing the script. But at the actor's studio, they ask the question, what if the script didn't say that? Then what would your character do? Then what choice would your character make? It's simply about understanding who your character is when they're not dictated by the text. Trudy's words essentially function as Tarantino's thesis statement, hinted at in the movie, but made far more explicit here in the book. She embodies the future of the industry and is the ultimate counterpoint to Rick Dalton's red apple smoke and rodeo writing. In addition to her nascent feminist sensibilities, Trudy represents a new generation of screen actors in both age and mentality. The John Waynes and Rick Daltons of the world are yesterday's men. Tomorrow's silver screen belongs to the sensitive, soul-searching students of famous method acting coaches like Lee Strasberg, Stella Adler, and Sanford Meisner. Of course, absent Sharon Tate's murder, the future as we know it is no longer certain. And through his revisionist history, Tarantino is challenging us to consider a future that, as Trudy says, is no longer dictated by the text. To that end, the book gives Rick an unqualified win for his career that the movie only hints at. 
It shows him embracing method acting and lets him revel in the joys and luxuries of playing cowboy for a little bit longer while reducing the violent horrors of the film's ending to little more than a footnote in his life story. Cheapers, this sounds like a good novel. In this way, while the movie and book both celebrate a Hollywood that was and imagine a world in which the 60s hadn't ended so violently, the book takes that optimism a step further. The movie wraps up by saving Sharon Tate. In contrast, the book makes a slightly bigger claim, suggesting that saving her and the other Manson victims might also have saved a part of the film industry itself, giving the stoic matinee idols of the studio era a few more years in the western sun before pivoting towards the more cynical, auteur-driven films that revolutionized the industry in the 70s. The book ends with Rick Dalton primed to step back into the limelight, his on-screen partnership with a different young actress inspiring him to embrace the next stage of his career in a movie business no longer haunted by the gruesome specter of the Tate LaBianca murders. Despite their many differences, both versions of this Hollywood fairy tale end with a happily ever after, but only the book gives us an indication of all that ever after might entail. So what do you think, folks? Are you ready to rush out and pick up this paperback or should Tarantino have stuck to the script? Let us know in the comments. Big thanks to our patrons for all your support. Hit that subscribe button like you're uppercutting a Mansonite and don't forget to ring that bell. And as always, thanks for watching. Later.